What is the fastest way to five hundred thousand dollars in a service-based business? How many conversations business? did you Today's have guest before shares how she you and her landed partner scale to the five hundred thousand dollars in sales clients. in the first year without how using complicated marketing you strategies before you or landed being on every the platform four to market to five their high business? Growth for this agency owner has also meant steadily growing a small how many but conversations team did you and have leaning into processes you over the last five the four years to five that high helped them grow to clients. multiple seven figures. Join me to hear how this agency owner hit half a million dollars in her first year and how she and her partner scaled how it to many multiple conversations seven figures did you have in five before years. Before you landed the four to five high ticket clients. Welcome to the Small But Mighty Agency Podcast. If you're a creative consultant or agency owner who wants to know what the roller coaster ride really looks like to grow your business from one to many, you're in the right place. My guest and I pull back the curtains on the realities of growing and running agencies of different sizes and what it takes to build a team. And if you're anything like me, you want more than the highlight reel. You want to learn from the mistakes of others so that you can stop short of making the same mistakes. I'm your host, Audrey Joy Kwan. I spend my days as a coach and consultant to multiple six and seven figure agency owners. For the last seven years, I've been behind the scenes helping people grow, lead and operate small but mighty agencies. Here at the Small But Mighty Agency podcast, we'll uncover what works and equally as important what didn't work to get these business owners to where they are today. Hi, Kristen. Welcome to the Small But Mighty Agency podcast. It's lovely to have a woman-led agency owner on the call from Manitoba. Tell us more about your agency. Sure. Uh, So I am one of two owners of an agency called Uphouse, and we are an agency that exists to support in-house marketers. So that's where uh, was our name inspiration in the early days of brainstorming names. And uh, we just kind of noticed uh, my business partner, Alex Verricchio, and I, we worked together in another agency and uh, it was kind of time to move on and do something ourselves. And we noticed, you know, with the diversification of marketing, just that shift happening, you know, seeing organizations building their in-house marketing team and maybe scaling back some of their agency commitments so that they could take a lot of that day-to-day stuff like digital marketing and website management, content creation, social media inside into an internal team. It makes sense. It's a good salary. But with that shift, uh, there was a little bit of a loss of some of that outside perspective that an agency partner would bring. So we came up with this uphouse agency and we came up with the business model and designed the services to be more collaborative and hands-on with the in-house team and fill in some of the gaps that that shift left behind. Thanks, Kristen, for giving us that summary. Before we started recording, we talked about revenue in your first year of business. Give us the goods. Yeah, for sure. So we made a business plan when we started Uphouse. We kind of set our goals for the first three years. And our goal for year one for revenue was 300000 and we did 500000 We also thought, <laughs> phew, <laughs> it's a lot of unknowns going into that first year. Yeah. And uh, I could think something else uh, that was significant, uh, of course, that contributes to that number is we were able to hire Uh, one full-time person in that first year where we were not expecting to. And what year of business are you in right now? Oh, it's our uh, fifth year, I guess. Yeah, we'll be coming up to our fifth year. I'm going to get into your fifth year in a little bit, but I want to rewind and talk about that first year of business and how you actually got to 500K. Can you share with us some of the things that you did to grow the business within 12 months into half a million dollars? Sure. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, we were coming from an agency. So of course, agency people know, you know, anytime you make an exit, there's a lot of different non-competes and things like that. But we had, you know, between the two of us, already worked in the industry for 10 years. So we had, you know, some good networks that we had built over time that, of course, like would not interfere with that non-compete. So we we just like put on our sales hats and uh, reached out to other 
marketing folks at prospective like client organizations so organizations we thought would be a good fit for what we had to offer and let them know what we were doing and just ask to take them for lunch and drinks and you know just ask if there was any opportunities within their organization or if they could refer us to anyone and you know we had like a bit of a a track record a reputation on some different campaigns we had worked on what we brought to the table as marketers so i think kind of asking for those direct referrals uh, folks sort of could see where we might be a fit either within their organization or, or one that they knew. What are some of those services that you offered in that first year? We were really heavy on brand, branding, a lot of brand refreshes and marketing planning. That was really, uh, Alex has had a real strength in marketing, planning, marketing strategy. For me, I had been doing a lot of branding work through my career pro- progression and copywriting. So that's that's where we leaned in. And those are the kind of services where you don't necessarily need like a big team behind you to execute it. Right. Because you're you're sometimes working in more of a consultant or strategist role. Yeah. And it sounds like in your first year, your team was the both of you plus one more person. Yes, you got it. Yeah. So we started in September and we brought her on in March of the following year. Tell us about the role of your first hire. Yeah, she, like us, wore a lot of hats. So um, we called her a creative and marketing manager. And so she helped with our own marketing and business development for Uphouse. And then naturally, once you start working with clients, you know, in brand or marketing strategy, there's always work that comes out of that, right? So then she would manage those projects and the execution of some of those different tactics that had come out of that work. How many clients were you serving in that first year of business where you hit half a million dollars? Mm, I would say we had, we got three or four good sized clients, like like established Manitoba head office here, decent, like good sized portfolio clients within that first six months. So probably, yeah, four to five clients were, were driving the bulk of that revenue. And then, you know, smaller, more like small business, entrepreneur, startup type clients would have would have made up a smaller portion of that number. How many conversations did you have before you landed the four to five high ticket clients? A lot of conversations. <laughs> yeah, because mm-hmm. I think even though Alex and I, we were not as individuals, like a risky venture, a new agency is a risky venture, right? Because especially for brand and marketing strategy, you're really bringing that agency in intimately into your organization and spending all of that time with them. And then you want to know that that agency is going to be able to manage or support you in the work that comes out of it and that they're not going to disappear in a few months when you're midway through your rebrand rollout, right? So I think I think folks just really needed to feel confident that our full, our full effort was behind this. We kind of had a plan in place to execute whatever tactics came out of the work. And, and also, I think that we would kind of have the attention and focus on their, their business, their project that they felt it deserved. You're pointing out that there was a lot of trust building to be done and developing your credibility as an agency. When you first started your business, people knew you, but they didn't know you as an agency owner. What did you and your partner do to create that trust and credibility to land four major clients that led to the bulk of the 500K in your first year? Oh, well, I would say that those those clients, you know, as much credit goes to them, right, for seeing something in us and choosing to start these projects with us. And I think once they did say, yes, let's get the ball rolling on this, you know, within that first month, they that that trust, that confidence grew, that they felt like we had a good process to how we were going about the project, that we were really hearing and understanding them, that maybe we were bringing something to the table or picking up something in their brand or marketing that other organizations had missed in the past. So feeling like, oh, we maybe did this culture work, but we weren't really happy with what came out of it. Or this company did this website for us, and it's taken a lot longer than we thought it was. So so then having someone come in with like a really clear process and a clear set of next steps and action items for everyone, kind of hitting those milestone dates, keeping the communication open, and then delivering something that they were really happy with and felt 
really resonated with with their brand and their organization, that's often what would then um, give that client the confidence to say, hey, can you also help us with X? And then just start to grow it that way. I love that you see the power of processes. Clients want to be led. They want to know that when they are paying a high ticket offer, the step-by-step is easy to understand, the touch points are clear, and they never have to guess what's next. Give us an example of one of your service delivery processes. I would say something Alex recognized right away in in his past agency role and also here is is productizing the offering, right? So I think as creatives, we sometimes feel like we need to reinvent the wheel with every client because every client is unique and has a unique situation that they're going through. And you feel like you need to maybe tailor the way you would work with them to their unique situation, but that actually does not inspire their confidence. What we found is if we really mapped out our brand process, for example, so, you know, labeling like we're starting with the brand platform and this is the workshop that we facilitate to develop the brand platform. And this is what's the in the agenda and what we're going to work through in that workshop. And then we're going to do stakeholder interviews and we're going to do this many interviews. And these are the questions we're going to ask. And then we're going to come back for a check-in. And we're going to present the brand platform, get your feedback, and we're going to present a mood board. Then we're going to move into logo design. We're going to explore lots of logos. We're going to show you our number one recommendation for a logo for you, only one logo. And then we're going to build out the graphic standards manual. They feel like, oh, yes, you know, I see exactly what's going to happen. Over time, they say, this has worked for another organization, so I know it's going to work for mine. And it just inspires that confidence in, in your process to get to a really good end result. And then also for the agency, it, it makes you a lot more efficient because you're not doubting yourself or, or second guessing yourself on the different exercises or tactics you're going to bring to that project. You might have like a couple different activities or tools in your tool belt, depending on, you know, is is it like, I don't know, a retail brand versus like a service brand, for example. But uh, it allows you, I think, to really get confident on how you extract this information from the client. So when you're facilitating a workshop like this or, or going through this process, you can really be present and in the moment with them, not trying to, you know, remember oh, what was this reference here or this story or this question or this example? So I find it it lets you just get to the good stuff in the case of branding. I'm glad that you brought up prioritized services. A prioritized service is backed by processes, making it repeatable. So you and your partner are not the only ones delivering it. The team can deliver it and get the results. So let's talk about team growth. You had five people on the team by the end of the year. Tell me more about that journey. Sure. So you know, I mentioned to you how we did a lot of brand projects. So you're probably wondering, like, how did you design the logo since neither you nor Alex are designers? Good question. <laughs> so in the early days, we relied a lot on outside art directors, so freelance subcontractor art directors and designers. So we would go through the work, we would put together the brief, we we had some folks, you know, in our local market, but also in the US and, and one gal in Australia who we had a relationship with and knew we'd like to work with. But of course, as your design projects grow and you kind of shift from maybe logo design to perhaps like campaign management, there's so many more assets that need to be created. So our our first hire outside Alex and myself was that creative marketing manager. And then our second hire was an art director. And so um, that kind of allowed us to, you know, handle some things in-house, but also through her guidance, expand that outside network and have it, those project requests coming from a designer to a designer, and then also a designer providing feedback to any subcontractors. And then our next hire after our art director was another creative and marketing manager. So another person essentially to manage the client relationships, manage the projects and and support with sort of the day-to-day operations of the agency. And our next person after that was a uh, a senior graphic designer to work under our art director as we were getting sort of more in-house design projects that we needed to put through the agency. In the first few months, it sounds like you were heavy on project base. And then once you start hiring the marketing managers, that's when you probably switched into more of a retainment model. Tell me how that happened for you. How did you switch from project into retainment model? 
Oh, that is such a good question because I feel like that's when you can really start planning for the future is when you have those clients that, you know, you work with them to develop their marketing calendar at the start of the year. They're very open with you about their marketing budget and sales goals. So you can have really good conversations around how to spend their money with them very openly. And then you can sort of steward that budget with their help for the rest of the year. Like that's when you can really plan your agency's growth for the future because you sort of have that that guaranteed, guaranteed income for the the upcoming year. And so I think leaning into marketing planning, marketing strategy services as an uphouse offering really helped with that because sometimes clients just want you to help build the plan and then they're going to execute it or maybe they have some other relationships that they're going to use to execute it. But in the cases when they say, okay, now uphouse, we want you to help us execute that, that's, I think, where the shift takes place. So you've earned their trust by providing that insight and strategic thinking at the planning stage. And then if you can demonstrate to them that you have the capabilities to execute it or that you can bring folks with the necessary skills to the table, that they say, okay, yes, now let's work on this together. That's, you know, it's such a great opportunity to really demonstrate what you have to offer. And, and if you can make those campaigns and different projects a success, most likely that client's going to want to say, oh, okay, great. What can we do next year? Or what can we do differently? And uh, if you kind of, yeah, if you can kind of keep keep retaining them, keep earning their business, normally it'll grow, right? If their marketing budgets grow, assuming um, their sales pipeline is healthy. And I think also having a sort of, a, I know, we don't use agency of record a lot anymore, but sort of an agency of record type client, it inspires the confidence of other clients to also bring their marketing portfolios to you as well. How did you go about pitching your retainer service and landing it? Yeah, I think similarly to how we sort of had to spend a lot of time having lunch in conversations with clients in those early days to get those first few projects, you definitely have to work at it to get those first few retainer or annual agreements. And so you have to ask for the business. So at the stage that you're developing the marketing plan, once we put all the tactics in a calendar, we would go through and we would kind of write like a who, what, where, when, why, how for every single tactic on that calendar. And in the who, we would be very upfront. This is something you can handle internally. This is something you can handle with your existing web partner. This is something Uphouse would like to do for you. And here's an estimate for that job. And so we just had to ask for the business. And, you know, some organizations are really organized with their marketing plan. They're super diligent, like that's their marching orders and their team is going to execute it. Some are a bit more like, well, you know, I wrote this, but I'm not sure I'm ready to pull the trigger. And I find with those folks, you you just got to stay on it a little bit more or kind of maybe break it down into like a phase one of this tactic. And if that goes well, and we're enjoying working together, and you're seeing the value, then we can ramp it up to the the full capacity we envisioned. The transparency piece, the part where you come to the table with a client and break down what they may need you for, but also what they don't need you for, and can take in-house to save them money. I love hearing that. When you show up with the intent to save the client money, what ends up happening is they see you as a high-value partner, and that creates trust, credibility, and conversations. Yeah, and I think you know that, that being honest about what the in-house team can manage that is our whole shtick here at Uphouse, right? Like <laughs> we we meet folks and we say, you know, we're Uphouse, we're all about supporting in-house. And, and that's where they see it, right? Like that's the proof right there when we say, you guys can do this. You know, we put a calendar together. We detailed the tactic. We met your team. We know the strengths you have on your team. Maybe we mock up some things for them to get started or share some resources their way or or do like a kickoff session together or review the work that they're doing like the first few times until they get in a groove. And some clients like really hold us accountable to that. <laughs> they're like, hey, Uphouse, I'm here for my in-house support and collaboration. Can you look at this billboard before I send it? We're like, okay. They're like, we told you we were going to do that. And, and so it's good. It's good when they hold us accountable to doing that. But you're right. It's like, we don't want to be designing a one-off billboard, right? We want to be working with them on a big recruitment campaign or enrollment campaign or community campaign uh, or something that really, you know, makes an impact, is going to really move the needle for them and is fun and creative work to do. 
I hear that there is an added value piece that you provide your clients. You offer to be the second eyes on the marketing work being done by their in-house team. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm sure lots of agency folks can relate to this when maybe you work with a client on a website or a brand or a content strategy. And while you're in it, it looks like fantastic. But then sometimes when you kind of step away and the in-house team steps up, they might approach that a little bit differently than you. And so then when you're maybe referring to that work in your portfolio or in a case study, folks go check out that resource. Oh, this doesn't quite look like the mock-ups I saw on your case study page. So continuing to have that relationship with the client, I think it just ensures the, the work that you're putting out to the world, that they're putting out to the world it meets that high standard for quality and creativity, originality. And it's also keeps those lines of communication open with that client. So, you know, maybe over the summer months, they're kind of good. They've got the projects that they're working on. Their in-house team is on top of it. But if you're still checking in with them or, or they're running things by you, then in September, maybe when they've added a new product to their portfolio, they might mention that to you, or you might hear those opportunities where you could say, oh, hey, You know, could we help you maybe with a launch campaign around this new product to get it on the radar of the early adopter clients who would really benefit from this? So it just keeps you connected. And and that way you can uh, listen for any opportunities where you might want to work more closely with them again. The theme really is relationship building. It's helping clients feel like you're not an outsourced agency, but a partner. When they come to you, they can be transparent, allowing you to engage at a higher level. This is just smart business. The added value will enable you to stay super connected to the client. You keep your ears to the ground for new scopes of work, and that increases the client's lifetime value. And it, I mean, I'm sure everyone says this, but like you want a client to come to you with a problem, right? You don't want them to come and ask you for a, a solution. Yeah, like this is exactly what I would like you to execute. And then you have to be like, um, I don't know if I would slice it. (laughs) But when someone comes to you and it's still like fuzzy and hard to pin down and hard to define, that's where you can really, I think like add a lot of value because you're going to look at that a hundred percent. You're going to look at that challenge in a totally different way. And then you can work together to figure out the right way to solve it. I can see how you've threaded the importance of relationship building into your marketing, service delivery, and retainment. In that first year, were you doing other marketing activities? Oh, yeah, we were. We did a big direct mail campaign. Woo! Fancy. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) What else? Tell me more. I want to know um, (laughs) if it worked or if it didn't work. I don't know if it worked. Like we... (laughs) We produced a bunch of white papers and we on various topics that we felt like identified a challenge that modern marketing teams are facing. And of course, it was a challenge that Uphouse was uniquely positioned to solve. And uh, we also did some white papers specifically targeted to different industries. So like B2B businesses, for example, that are selling through a channel partner and have a little bit different marketing need than maybe a direct to consumer brand. And uh, and then we put lead lists together and put handwritten notes with these white papers and these envelopes. And we went to our local pub and had a note writing party <laughs> uh, and mailed out all of these things. And, you know, of course, it's like it's very expensive and it's very time consuming. I think we had maybe like a dozen fall like that like follow-ups but we obviously had to do a lot of the work like pick up the phone call did you get this you know you get a lot of no's a lot of voicemails a lot of that person doesn't work here anymore a lot of I'm not the decision maker for that but I think what that is helpful for is it especially in our local community where you know when someone's perhaps going to put out an, an RFP or a job to tender they look and see who's in the local market even though there may not have been any opportunities at the time we sent that out that put us on the radar for that that RFP list, for example. Did you know that I have a free team growth roadmap? Imagine if you didn't spend all day, every day in the weeds of running your business. That can mean more flexibility, more freedom, less overwhelm. I created the team growth roadmap to help my clients gain direction on the strategic systems and leadership actions for a streamlined business and a self-managing team to grow your business. Inside the roadmap, I share my compass method, an acronym for each step of the roadmap to get you out of the weeds of running your business and help you have a small but mighty 
team that gives you more freedom and flexibility. You can get all the details over at AudreyJoyKwan.com. That's A-U-D-R-E-Y-J-O-Y-K-W-A-N.com. Or click the link in the show notes right there in your podcast app. Back to the show. I love the perspective that no effort is wasted. You mentioned that it increased visibility, but more importantly, it put you on RFPs or request for proposal list. Can you share more? Uh, Manitoba has a lot of crown corporations. So we got on those lists Mm, and those RFPs in Manitoba, they're not usually put on Mercs, which is like a platform for often like national as well as federal government to issue RFPs in Manitoba. Often they're sent to four or five Manitoba based agencies being Manitoba crown corporations. They want to keep that money in Manitoba. So they will often choose to put their, their marketing program with a Manitoba agency. So it's important just to stay on their radar, maybe perhaps build relationships with members of the marketing team within those organizations you know, either just through your personal network or maybe industry association groups uh, so that you can you can be included on those distribution lists when they do decide to issue an RFP. How has the RFP process worked out? Tell us about the ones you landed. We have successfully, I guess, landed RFPs with uh, Tech Nation, which is a Canada wide industry association for companies in the tech sector. And they administer a government program called the Student Work Placement Program, where they provide subsidies for businesses to take students that use tech in their job, uh, students who are returning to school on a, a paid work placement. And so it's a, it's a really big program and that went to RFP. So we landed that one. We also recently landed one for Efficiency Manitoba, which is uh, an, a new Crown Corporation formed to specifically help the province of Manitoba achieve energy saving targets over the next 15 years. So that was an RFP, as well as some other, some some new ones that I can't tell you at this time, but we could perhaps circle back on. <laughs> and also, I guess, Audrey, sometimes a, a private a private business will issue an RFP as well, either for maybe a brand engagement or a web project or a standalone campaign. Kristen, thanks for sharing the successes of your marketing efforts. Let's switch gears. Now that you are five years in, what does your team look like? So including Alex and myself, we now have, we have 19 people today. Two of those folks are interns. The rest are full-time employees. And we, I guess some ways we have changed, we have a lot more folks in digital. So digital marketing expertise, web development, Google ads, paid social, that whole wheelhouse. Uh, We have a number of client managers, so folks managing our various client projects and relationships. We we really select for folks with a strong writing capability, either folks that can do a bit of copywriting or know how to vet quality writing um, and ensure it's, you know, accuracy and against matches a client's voice and tone guidelines. And uh, yes, and we have another full-time in-house designer as well. Oh, and we also have a video production manager, which was an interesting choice for us because it's quite a specialized skill, but we just found we were doing so many video projects, right? Like if you think about digital content, video is it. It is still the top performing type of content you can put out on a digital platform, social media. YouTube is like the world's biggest search engine. And we were we were doing so many different video projects and it, it, it is a a specialty to manage that. So rather than training up all of our client managers on managing video projects and and fitting that into their workload, we made the decision to hire a video production manager who could uh, run those projects a lot more efficiently and also really build sort of the uh, subcontractor collaborator network around that to bring different director of photographies and animation styles and shooting styles to the table. So running a team of one person to running a team of 19 people requires a lot of change. You go from being a doer in your business to CEO. Name some of the challenges you've bumped up against as you grow your team. Oh, man, it's like a work in progress. I don't think we have that figured out yet. (laughs) And every, every, you know, couple more folks that we hire, it, it changes sort of the way we work. And so as much as I would love to get like the perfect org chart. I'm not sure that that exists or 
I think we can get close to it. <laughs> yeah, or it's perfect for a week and then something changes. <laughs> yeah. But that, I mean, yeah, it's tough, right? Uh, hiring is is terrifying. Like, you, you know, you're often taking someone from a, a, a well-paying job and, you know, in the early days, bringing them to a startup. So that is a very serious responsibility that you're taking on. And then, you know, we were talking about sort of those retainer based or agency of record based clients. But, you know, when marketing, nothing is guaranteed when organizations go through difficult times. Many of us saw this during the pandemic. Marketing is often one of the first lines on the budget that gets cut. Um, so there's always that uncertainty. And and it really, I think, with every additional staff member kind of re-ups that fire for business development and to make sure that your sources of revenue are well diversified. For example, not all of your revenue is just coming from one really big client and the rest are really small clients. And then I think, yeah, for me and, and Alex as well, you know, you mentioned like being very hands on and involved in sort of the day to day operations of the business. And as the team gets bigger, you just can't like you just can't take that way that you worked with one employee and multiply that to 17 employees. So we're we're elevating and hiring more directors and trying to give some of that management responsibility to those directors. Um, look to those directors more for adding new services or changing our services. So, you know, we talked about productizing that. So identifying where there may be a gap or or something that's emerging as a demand that we're seeing among our clients. And and rather than me and Alex working at this alone in an echo chamber, bringing more folks to the table to help uncover those opportunities and figure out what's our way to respond to them. And then also process as well, you know, the way we work together, that's, you know, that's also a moving target, but uh, trying to lean on our people to, to tell us how they want to work, the best way to move projects through the agency and that we can be the visionary saying, these are the core values about us that we don't want to change, but leaning on the team to figure out how we get that done on a day to day. You're at the phase of business where you need to build a leadership team and lean on them to help you identify opportunities, and they will further refine your processes. As you get further from the day-to-day -day work, your role is to be the coach, look at the KPIs, and make sure the entire ship is sailing in the right direction. That is so true. And you know, like when I would think about, you know, at the end of the day, I would look back and say, do I feel like I really accomplished something that day? I feel the the most sense of accomplishment when I spent that day mentoring and training, because that's how you're going to achieve that scale, right? Absolutely. You can't just hand over the coaching and mentoring of your team if you want to scale. I'm curious if there was one or two things you could do differently in your first few years, what would it have been? We have gotten so much value out of associations. So it didn't take us very long to become a certified diverse supplier with the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. We achieved that certification maybe a year and a half into the business. But honestly, if we could have achieved that day one, I would have. <laughs> it has provided so much value. And honestly, Audrey, it continues to be a real point of differentiation for Uphouse compared to other agencies that we might come up against when we're submitting for a bid is, is our focus on diversity. Because I think especially over the last two years in Canada, organizations want to bring diverse voices to the table. Absolutely. They have realized like very harshly for some of them what a lack that is, a gap in their procurement. So who they're working with, uh, who they're hiring as partners and service providers, their staffing and also their marketing and the, the customers they're seeking out to. And so Supplier Diversity Canada is this big network of diverse owned businesses. And there's various like specialized chambers of commerce and individual groups, for example, like the Canadian Aboriginal Minority Supplier Council of Canada, Canadian Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned, there's associations that serve businesses whose owners may have a physical disability, veterans, Indigenous organizations. and Canada's biggest businesses want to work with these suppliers, either someone perhaps that works with them directly in everything from, for example, like gift boxes at an event to cleaning the carpets to telco services to database management to batteries, and then also tier two suppliers. So, for example, maybe they would like their, I don't know, catering company to get ingredients from diverse owned businesses. And 
it takes time to build relationships within that network with the procurement departments. So the sooner you start, the sooner you can get on the radar of these organizations that want to work with agencies like us. Thank you for sharing that. Kirsten, before we wrap up here, what keeps you inspired and at your best? I am figuring that out. (laughs) Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's so funny. When I first entered this industry, I never saw myself as an agency owner because it seemed like if you were going to own the agency or sit in that president or CEO suite, you kind of sacrifice that creative part of your identity. So you hired great creatives to do the work and you ran the business. But for me, I got to find my own way to do that because I cannot give up that part of myself. That's why I love this industry is the creativity and the opportunity to try so many different jobs from the comfort of your own, right? Every time you meet a new client and get embedded in their business, it's cool. Like you figure out what brings their staff to work every day and um, it's not something I'm willing to let go of. So I think for me, it's really figuring out how I can can keep that creative work in my day. And uh, and I think that if you work for an organization where the leaders are really passionate about the quality of creative that you're putting out and new ideas and trying new things and taking risks, that inspires that appetite for that kind of work throughout the organization. So I think there's definitely a business case for that too. Where can people find you and your agency? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm pretty good on... Uh, on LinkedIn, I would say is a good place to follow me professionally. So Kirsten May. And then Uphouse is uh, is active on all the channels except for Twitter. So they can find Uphouse Inc. on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. And uh, and trying we're trying to get more active on YouTube. We'll see how we do there. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. It was a pleasure. You as well. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thanks for listening to the Small But Mighty Agency podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on iTunes. It would mean the world to me. Or send a screenshot on Instagram while tagging me at Audrey Joy Kwan.